Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Okay. Uh, welcome to SOAS. It's fantastic to see you all here uh, for what I, I know is going to be a wonderful evening. Very thought-provoking, stimulating, interesting conversation. And, and uh, we're going to see a little bit of the Ambassador's film as well. So I'm very excited about that. My name is Steve Hopgood. I am a political science professor in the school. I'm also uh, one of the pro-directors, which means a sort of deputy director, and I look after our international outreach, um, our sort of international profile. I was very lucky to meet the ambassador in Washington uh, last year, I think, late last year. So I'm just going to uh, give you a few words of introduction. I'm sorry I'm hunched over, but can you still hear me if I speak from there? Is that clear enough? Good. And I won't get a crick in my neck. Um, uh, I want to uh, just say a few words about SOAS in particular and draw your attention. This is just our holding slide, uh, but we have launched a, a campaign called Questions Worth Asking. One of the things that's very special about SOAS, and we're very happy to welcome you all here tonight to share this with us, is we pride ourselves on being a school that tries to face facts, sees things as they are, and asks really difficult and challenging and critical questions about what's happening in the world. And from that point of view, the talk we're going to have tonight fits perfectly. We'd also like to uh, announce to you that as part of our um, uh, Education Beyond Borders um, uh, uh, campaign led by our students, we've recently uh, we've launched before a sanctuary scholarship appeal. And the reason I mention this to you is that I think we've just relaunched this. Yeah, we just sort of. Yeah. Um, so we've just relaunched our sanctuary scholarship appeal. So I really would urge you after this. This is about displaced scholars who scholars from Iraq, scholars from Myanmar, scholars from elsewhere who've been uh, driven out of their countries by conflict. Um, so after this event, it would be wonderful if you'd log on to our website and have a look at that, and perhaps, if possible, um, uh, think about supporting us in supporting displaced scholars uh, coming to work at SOAS. We have over 300 academic staff focused on all aspects of the humanities and social sciences. And the research taking place at SOAS can help practitioners, governments and international organisations address important social issues and political challenges. One of those research projects, uh, led by um, Dr Amina Yakin, uh, the Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue, analyses the conditions of trust and mistrust in three overlapping areas of modern life, politics and society, business and finance, and art and culture. And it's just that kind of project that we do here that uh, the talk tonight will speak to, the work that um, Ambassador um, Ahmed has been doing speaks to, and uh, the reason we're very happy to welcome you here tonight. I will introduce the professor briefly and Lord Bhikkhu Parekh, who we're also very honoured has joined us. Then what we're going to do is we're going to see the beginning and the end of the film, Journey into Europe, uh, which will take about 15, 20 minutes, I think. And then I will invite the ambassador and Lord Parekh to come up onto the stage. They will uh, uh, ask each other a few questions and engage in a conversation, which I'll moderate. And then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Ambassador Ahmed is the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies in the School of International Service at American University in Washington, DC. He belonged to the Senior Civil Servants of Pakistan, Civil Service of Pakistan, and was the Pakistan High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. He's also taught at Harvard and Princeton universities and holds a PhD in anthropology from SOAS, which is wonderful. Uh, I would like to offer a huge congratulations on his forthcoming book, Journey into Europe. Please, there are uh, copies with a very generous discount available outside. So once you've heard the talk, please don't move past the table without buying your copy. Um, uh, I'd also like to welcome back to SOAS, Lord Bhikkhu Parekh. Uh, Lord Parekh is an emeritus professor at the Universities of Hull and Westminster, the author of several widely acclaimed books. His academic speciality lies with political philosophy, modern Indian political thought, and the philosophy of ethnic relations. Lord Parekh was chair of the Runnymede Commission on the Future of Multi-Ethnic Britain. So I think you'll agree it's, it would be very hard for us to find two better suited speakers uh, tonight. So, uh, without further ado, I'll ask for uh, the um, uh, beginning and the end of uh, Ambassador um, Akbar Ahmed's film to be played, and after that we'll hear from him and from Lord Perek. Thank you very much. Welcome to SOAS.
terrorist incident. A man believed to be a British soldier was hacked to death by two attackers who were later shot and wounded by police. We must fight them as they fight us. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You people will never be safe. This British man has to pay the price for your promise, Cameron. By the time they'd stopped, at least 12 people were dead. 129 people were killed in Friday night's terror attacks in Paris. Authorities say three teams of attackers launched gun and bomb attacks at several locations in the French capital. C'est un acte de guerre qui a été commis par une armée terroriste. Nous ne pouvons pas perdre cette guerre parce que c'est au fond une guerre de, de civilisation. Islam is incompatible with all Western civilization. The war has started. People just need to wake up and pick a seat. They, they feel they, they are better, they feel they are more civilized than... The xenophobic tidal wave that's sweeping across Europe currently. In Saddam's Iraq, they will put you in front of a wall and shoot you. In Denmark, they strangle you slowly, slowly. Now it's, I think it's reached a stage where it's a bit intolerable. Every single part of our community is under, under scrutiny. And as a rabbi, as a Jew, as a human being, I'm shocked. I have never seen it as open, as virulent, as hateful as it is right now. Anybody who isn't a Muslim has never been to a mosque. They're not places that other people would go to. They're imams, they're elder are really the problem. Are we seeing a clash of civilizations? Many are saying Islam and European identity are incompatible and that Islam has contributed nothing to Western civilization. Others disagree. The Islam gehört to Deutschland. I mean, Muslims are part of Europe. All through all this place. As a Muslim scholar living in the West, I set out to seek the answers with my trusty team. When you realize you've not really got close to your neighbors, you can either panic or you sit with them and listen. Our journey is in three phases. We first explore the past in Andalusia and Sicily when different religions could live together. The next phase is of Ottoman expansion into Europe and resistance to it. And the final phase, closer to our times, is of European colonization and immigration. A new situation has developed for Muslims after 9-11. Some, like the young Muslim living in Belgium, whose father is the imam of this small mosque on the Moroccan-Spanish border, have been caught up in the war on terror. They took advantage of him visiting his father here in Melilla, because it's close to the border of Morocco to be taken from here to Morocco. And that's it, we never knew anything else from him. Even if you're friends with someone that is involved, if you do, even if you don't know what he's doing, just, just becoming a friend of him or going to the mosque together, then you're supposed to be somewhat involved on the business. I, I want okay. to ask him a question. Okay. As a father, what has he felt in his heart with his son who just disappeared? Como lo siento yo? No lo puedo contar. So there has no, I have no muy duro. It's very hard. Not solo yo, sino que me ha dejado aquí la mujer. Not only me, but the viviendo, wife of him and, and, the, and the, little, the little daughter. He should, as a Muslim, as a believing Muslim, have faith in God, and inshallah he will see his son, and he will see if they'll be reunited. Tell him he has many years, inshallah, to live with his son. Dice que tiene, que todavía te quedan muchos años para vivir con tu hijo. Yo lo que dice, pero mi deseo es que yo, antes de morir, que vengan mi hijo. He says that before I die, the only thing I want is just to see my son. When I see my son, then I can die. Can I see my son again? Inshallah. Inshallah. Hermano, nos vamos porque tenemos que ir a visitar ahora unos barrios. Pero bueno. You see, you see all these uh, tubes? Yes, yes. This is pepper spray, so when they touch it, they are activated. Other Muslim immigrants in the hundreds of thousands have been escaping the poverty and political chaos at home. 
imagine uh, Pakistani families, Syrian families, I'm talking families, people, I mean, uh, pregnant women, uh, little children, babies. They came across. Yeah, they came across that. They're not going to jump the border. They just use fake passports or they are hidden in cars or trucks or even in rafts. But it's expensive. In Sicily, we met Amadou, a 16-year-old from Gambia whose harrowing journey across the Sahara and the Mediterranean took him over one year. Amadou is coming. Amadou is coming. Oh, good. Can we talk to him inside? Yes, yes. How did you find this mosque? This mosque mm. is a one, one journalist man. They find us uh, at the at the street we are sleeping there. This is where the refugees are put when they arrive here from uh, North Africa, Middle East, in these boats when the uh, Imam and the mosque gives them support, shelter. They are given a place to sleep, food to eat. I don't have money. I just go the same thing. I just go and pick. When somebody eats and he eats it. Pick it up. After I come, I, I pick it. Food is good, sometimes it's not good. Sometimes you will go, you cannot eat. But anyway, you must try to have something in your stomach. One day, I came to the station. One man, one man looked me, he hit me two times. Who hit you? I don't know whether it's a policeman or what, but it's, it's the police, police station. Uh, is this is this boy even standing there? He looked me like this. He said, move, move here. He hit me two times. He broke at me two times. But with, with his head? Yes. He, he do like this two times. So I see I cannot do nothing. I used to sit and cry. I want a place where you know that I am free. I don't, I'm not thinking about transfer or to go somewhere else. I'm thinking about to get up and go to school, or to get, to get up and go and have work. I'm trying my best to help my family, anyway, my family, because I'm the elder. I'm the elder, yes. And I want to make something tomorrow for that, so that my family will be happy about me. I'm speaking about immigration, so-called immigration, through Mediterranean area. A terrible tragedy. A killer, killer has a name, President's permit. Why everybody tries to, to land in Sicily? Because for Sicilians, no man is illegal. We feel this sense of hospitality in our, in our spirits, in our, in our blood, I would say. But uh, it's very frustrating when you see these people coming with their life in a little uh, plastic bag and you, are, you, 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 you would do everything for them, but there's no other way to help because it, it cannot be work uh, or job opportunities for every one of them. So it's like like surviving in a jungle. The strongest survive, the, 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 the weakest won't survive. The road ahead is fraught with real dangers. The challenge for European Muslims is to rediscover the passion for knowledge and pluralism that once defined Andalusia. I am astonished at the magnificent contribution of Muslims to European civilization and am sorrowful at their predicament today. But Muslims have to vigorously challenge those who promote violence in the name of Islam. Europe's challenge is to rediscover the links between the Greeks, the Muslims in places like Andalusia, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment. All of them share the idea of universal humanism and treating the other with dignity and justice.
they must reject all forms of racial or religious intolerance. If it can overcome these challenges, Europe will once again become a beacon of civilization for the world. Let's pray then to the Archangel St. Raphael, who was always together with the, with the people who are traveling, so he might protect you and defend you against all evils, and that he might grant you success in your, in your task. That work is so important that you devote your life that you put yourself into this hardship of traveling around. And I know what it means. I cannot think of it. Uh, more warm feelings than I have towards your uh, work. It's the work of, I think it's wonderful that you have a new, another generation following up. So uh, you have really my, my most uh, hard feelings uh, to, to succeed. I notice, my friend Professor, that you are wearing a tartan tie. I love this uh, this tartan, that tartan and all tartans, because tartan is a very special cloth which is woven in a very particular way of many different colours and shades and designs, and it comes together, each tartan, distinctive in itself, with a combination of all of these colours and threads within it. And your project, I think, I'm going to describe as the Tartan Project because your project is going to explain to people on a worldwide canvas of the particular contribution Muslims have made throughout history. I regard your project as the future Tartan of Islam. I will never forget you guys. You are uh, Amin, Amina. I will never forget you. You are like a child. I will never forget you guys. Amadou, I want to see you smiling now. Yes, I'm smiling. I'm smiling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you, Petro. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Absolutely pleasure. And I'm delighted you're giving me this hug in a mosque. Thank you, brother. Is this still on now, this? There you go. Uh, Ambassador Akbar Ahmed to come up and address us for 20 minutes. I'd like to thank Dr. Stephen Hopgood for welcoming us, hosting this evening. I want to thank all of you for being here, many members of my family, many friends. I wish I could name you and single you out, each one of you. Uh, I will especially like to thank Lord Bhikkhu Parikh, uh, who to me symbolizes great academic and moral integrity. He launched this project, Journey into Europe, at the House of Lords four years ago. He then joined me here at SOAS in the same room when we came back with our research findings. And here's, here he is again launching the book. So I would like to, from my heart, really wish my, uh, express my very warm gratitude to you, Bhikkhu. And he's come all the way from Hull and has to catch a train out. So when he walks out, please don't see this as a potential headline in Pakistan. 
Indian scholar walks out of Pakistani <laughs> scholar's presentation. We are, we are very close friends. Now, I would like to say it's such an honor to be back at SOAS. It's such a great honor. I'm an alum, one of the alum here and always proud to be back and see the intellectual um, ferment in this great uh, house of learning. The project had a heart, and the heart is a philosophic question which my colleagues often debate at SOAS, which is, it really reflects Aristotle's great question uh, who centuries ago asked, what is the purpose of life? So it's coming out of Socrates and Plato. What is the purpose of us even, even being here? What is it all about? And the answer, if you were a Muslim in the Middle East, in parts of Central Asia, in Afghanistan, in East Africa, the answer to that, what is the purpose of life, is simply to survive. It's not the elite, it's not the middle classes who often uh, survive the violence and the turmoil, but for Muslims, it literally is to survive. And if you were a minority member, perhaps a Christian in Pakistan or Egypt, you'd have exactly the same response, it's simply to survive. That's the nature of the world we are living. So philosophically, the question I wanted to tackle in this project, and this is the fourth of a quartet, but the previous projects was really to ask myself, how can we live together as majority and minority within the same national borders? How can we live together? How can we reach out and create understanding with the other who may be of a different religion or race? So this became the philosophic lens through which we looked at these projects. The focus was over the last decade in which I did these projects was to look at the relationship between Islam and the West. And inspired by Lawrence Durrell's idea of the Alexandria Quartet, a set of novels which I read as an undergrad in the 60s, I looked at the same problem. Uh, Lawrence Durrell looked at a story set in Alexandria from four different perspectives of four different characters in the story. I looked at this problem from first the Muslim world looking at the West, the first big project that I conducted, then Americans in the West looking at the Muslim world. Again, we spent uh, uh, a year in the field, traveling in the United States, went to 75 cities and made a film and uh, wrote up a book. And the third project was tribal societies. The book was called The Thistle and the Drone. How do tribal societies living on the periphery of nations look at the central government? Now, if you take the belt, the Muslim belt from Morocco into North Africa, Middle East into uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus Mountains, you will note these tribal societies living on the periphery invariably have problems with the center. And these problems are not new. They go back to the time of the colonial era. They are problems, but we often in our post 9-11 world simplify this as the tribal areas versus the West. So somehow the West has got involved after 9-11. The fourth project was Journey into Europe, which is what we are discussing in the book that we are launching. Now, in terms of Hegelian dialectics, it has a very simple thesis. There's a thesis that could be rooted in what we understand as primordial tribal identity, which can take and assume the shape of predator identity. We have many examples throughout European history. An antithesis to this, which is the paradigm presented by Andalusia, where it was possible for different religions and cultures to survive, not perhaps for a thousand years, but certainly for long periods of time, and does provide a very strong counter to the thesis and could be called the antithesis. And we are looking now in the 21st century for a synthesis where you can preserve both and yet move forward. That, I believe, is the challenge of the politicians and the scholars and the intellectuals. All these projects, these four projects, were studied in the field with my American team, mostly American, but also non-American, and they involved straightforward anthropological method. This is not an anthropological study in the traditional sense, but I use the methods of participant observation, extended interviews, diaries, and all the standard work that anthropologists rely on, and that proved very, very useful, and I hope the anthropologists in the audience, and I know Jonathan Benthel is here, will note this, that the method was relied on and was very, very effective. 
uh, to the point that uh, the American counselor, Zach, uh, yesterday said that this is really, perhaps with, without anthropology, you cannot understand some of the uh, uh, developing situation in the, in the Muslim world. The focus was also on the core issues that are concerning us and are discussed in the media. We hear of terrorism, of immigration, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has re-emerged, uh, as you're seeing in, in Europe, and the emergence of the far right. And where does all this intersect? Where do all these lines intersect and how do they impact Muslims? And of course, how will they impact Muslims in the long term? Because I need to remind you that Europe has a history, the 1930s, 1940s, when the thesis very much assumed a, a predatory aspect where minorities became targets and there was a very cruel and violent end uh, to that episode of history. So we have to be very, very cautious about where this thing is heading and how it will end. Uh, we cannot be complacent, we cannot overlook these uh, trends of history. There are politicians, major politicians on the continent talking about the external enemy, by that they mean Muslims, the internal enemy, by that they mean the Jewish community. Uh, already they're identifying the uh, minority that they wish to target. And we know from our studies that societies have a cause and effect principle. So if you do something, it's going to have an effect. And over time, you've seen this happening again and again in, his, in history. So if a majority population singles out a minority and targets it, you constantly suggest that this minority population is unreliable, they're dirty, they are uh, traitors, they're a fifth columnist, they shouldn't be here. You build up so much hatred against that minority community that violence is almost inevitable. And if you have violence against one or two or three individuals, any incident, something that triggers something else, you may end up with some very violent scenes involving larger members of that community. So we need to be very careful of cause and effect and what's happening in some of these societies. We also know that members of political parties in Europe today uh, talk about concentration camps, reviving that, building them. They talk about soap factories, which is a chilling reminder of what happened in the past in, in Europe. And I am uh, both discouraged uh, confronting the reality of fieldwork because, I, as I said, this entire exercise was based in fieldwork. And uh, we were very, very careful about the fieldwork to be impeccable, which meant that I divided the Muslim community into three broad categories. The immigrant community, South Asians, uh, North Africans and so on. And there was a pattern we found so that North Africans were invariably heading for France. That was the relationship. South Asians heading for Britain. Again, the colonial relationship. Turks heading for Germany because they were on contract. They were brought as guest workers on contract. And once they came, like many of the South Asians to Britain, they invariably stayed on. And once that happened, you had the next generation, and now you have the third generation. And there you have the problems that are emerging in the community and its relations with the majority, because technically they had come for a short period of time. Make some money, send it home, and eventually go back, but that has not happened. It hasn't happened in um, uh, Germany either. So you can see this becomes from the problems of one simple uh, society or country to a global problem throughout the continent. And when you see the immigrants, you assume, well, Muslims are basically immigrants. You may say like 9-11 nine, uh, nine happened in America, and very often Americans equated Arab to Islam. Very often after 9-11, people would say, you Arabs are doing this. And I'd say, no, Arabs are a very important part of Islam, but they're only 18%, 18%, which is not even the majority. So people then equate the whole Muslim world to, to the Arabs. But that's the immigrants. They played a, a significant role and they made a huge impact. The second category was the indigenous Muslims, again, often overlooked. So when you talk of Muslims, you'll talk of Arabs and Pakistanis and so on. We forget that there are millions and millions of indigenous Muslims living in the Balkans. And they've been Muslims for centuries. Uh, we met 
thousands of blue-eyed, blonde Muslims, Europeans, and very proud of being Europeans, very proud of the cultural legacy of Europe, but also very proud of being Muslim. And in some senses, in some senses, the ideal Muslims, because they're also now rediscovering their Islam and really absorbing it in, in, a, in a very exemplary way. And the third category, small in number but significant, is that of the convert. Converts in Germany, France, Britain. Consistent converts into Islam. And they're bringing something very different into Islam. They're bringing their cultural inheritance, the legacy of Europe and intellectualism. And they're very often going back to source. So I find that dynamic a very interesting one because they sometimes are baffled with the immigrants who often bring in their culture. So very often a Pakistani will say, this is how Islam is. And what they're really saying is, this is how our culture is. The converts will, of course, go back to source. They'll go to the Quran, they'll go to the Holy Prophet and his example, and they'll give what their interpretation is of a purer and more authentic Islam. But these are the three different categories. And we were scrupulous about interviewing people from each category spread across Europe. So while interviewing them, we became aware of the differences in terms of the colonial impact on these immigrants. Now, all colonialism is in the end negative and detrimental to societies. There's many positives they bring, education and schools and so on, but overall there is a very negative detrimental effect that is left behind on the local community. It's almost a death of that community in one form. It has to be reborn in a very different form. But we found that British colonialism was distinctly different, not to inferior or superior, but different to French colonialism. And that again helped us understand the relationship, how North Africans fare in France. It's coming from the colonial relationship, how South Asians fare in Britain. Again, very di distinct. And you can see some of the results that with all the recent uh, developments of um, these uh, far-right parties targeting uh, the minorities, we also have the example of a mayor who's uh, Muslim background, uh, television hosts, uh, cricketers, uh, academics, uh, tremendous impact, uh, members of parliament, House of Lords and so on, many of Bhikkhu Parikh's uh, colleagues who are lords who are from South Asia. So Britain had one idea of absorbing and including its former colonies in a very positive way, inclusiveness, while at the same time there were always expressions of their own specific ethnicity and identity and a lot of them had ideas of superiority. So those were in contradiction but that was part of their identity. So having examined, talked to, interviewed, researched hundreds of people across Europe, uh, and we made sure we went to the northernmost city and the southernmost and the easternmost and the westernmost, and came across communities that people had not even heard of. Some incredible um, stories, communities tucked away in the middle of nation states, some forgotten, some wiped out with the changes in history, but we were able then to present it all in a very rich way, very rich ethnography in this particular book. I will um, point out the dedication of my team. Uh, they have inspired me and they've moved me, they worked with me over the years. They never complained about the hard, long slogs we had in the field, some very, very difficult uh, periods of trying to juggle travel with uh, budgets running out, with uh, battling three or four bureaucracies at the same time, but in the end, we managed it all to our satisfaction, which is really to aim for the best possible result, and that is what we have, and we feel very, very satisfied. Now, what are the broadly, I'm, I'm speaking very broadly, our research findings? Research findings, I would say, the first and most important the first and most important research finding is Europe must start listening to its sages, to its wise men and women. We met some very impressive people on this journey, but I find they're not really heard. So when I see television, I'll get all these commentators who yesterday may have been experts on is there water on the moon or Mars or whatever, and today they're talking about Islam with such authority, they become the experts. And very often their limited understanding of the subject of Islam means that a lot of their limited knowledge of the subject is now broadcast and becomes part of 
how society sees Muslims and the Muslim community. So first recommendation, listen to your sages. Treasure them, go to them and let them talk to you and let them give you advice. Uh, I'll share one bit of advice that I received from the chief rabbi of Denmark, a legendary man called Bent Melchior. You saw him in the film, Chief Rabbi Bent Melchior. He's so famous that two of his sons are chief rabbis. He's, he's retired, but he's very well known in Denmark. So I asked him, I said, uh, Rabbi, I want your advice for the Muslim community. What should I tell my community? At the end of the journey, what can I bring to them? What can I share with them? What hope would you give them? From your own experience as a senior member of the Jewish community. And he gave me these three pieces of advice, and I want you to think of them and all the many Muslim leaders and scholars here. Please remember this, because it's a perspective of a friend from outside the community. So the first thing he said was, let me tell you how the Jewish community started in Denmark. We came here centuries ago, and we opened a school, a really good school. We put a lot into it. But it wasn't to teach the Jewish community about Jewish history and culture and religion. It was to teach them about Danish culture and Danish history. And that struck me immediately, because very often we do the opposite. Muslims are always keen on education, but we very often create a school and then we invariably have boundaries around it. And sometimes it gets so bad that we then begin to say this is a Sunni school and a Shia school and Barelvi and Deobandi, and before you know it, there are boundaries within boundaries. He said, no, you have to reach out, not reach in. Very good point. Number two, he said that Muslims, like Jews, like minorities, have rights. And those rights must be honored. They need to be guarded, those rights. But the majority also has its rights, just like you have rights. And again, that struck me, because very often, we overlook the fact that the majority population also has its rights. So if they want to live their life in a certain way, they have the right to live it. It's their country, they're in the majority, and they've been here long before we've come here. So both must learn to respect and appreciate each other. Third, he said, you have to remember that when one of us did something wrong, one Jew, Jew uh, individual, inflicted uh, hurt on someone or did some fraud, did some misdemeanor, the entire community is going to get blamed. So the society at large is going to say, you see, all Jews are like this. This is how Jews are. That's your stereotype. And that, he said, is what's happening to your community. So that today you have Muslims being blamed for all of the violence taking place. And if you think about it, that's how it works. So if something happens in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or in Somalia, all Muslims are suddenly Muslims are doing this, Muslims are involved in terrorism and so on. So he said, again, you have to be conscious. It's not personal. You have to play your role in trying to minimize the brittle uh, relationships that exist at this time. And the way Islam is then demonized and misunderstood and everything is distorted, but it's happening because these are the principles on which society functions. That struck me as very sensible, and again, there's just one sage giving me one piece of advice. Uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, another sage, and this time of Britain, the former chief rabbi, he wrote a book called The Dignity of Difference. Now, if you haven't read the book, I would strongly urge you to read it. It's one of the great books which should be read. Uh, Karen Armstrong, again, from London, The Battle for God. These are great books we should all be reading and learning from. These are sages of Europe. And we need to hear them and listen to them. From the Muslim side, you have uh, Mustafa Cherich, who was the Grand Mufti of Bosnia. In Bosnia, there were some very impressive Muslim scholars, and uh, they continue to contribute to this field of scholarship. We also learned that there is a problem, and it's a universal problem, but more applicable to Muslims now. Uh, the tension, perhaps unsaid, unspoken, between the older and the younger generation. But there's a kind of, I would even use the word breakdown, where the values of the older generation have partly communicated themselves to the younger generation, but not fully, and therefore some of the problems and frictions 
begin to arise. It's a generational thing. And so many of our case studies were based on exactly this problem. So for example, there was Aksa from Glasgow, you may recall her case, very famous case, very bright girl, 16, 17 years old. She could have been member of parliament, she could have been a professor, she could have done anything in her life. She came from a good, well-settled, middle-class Pakistani family. And one day, she just disappeared to become a jihadi bride. What happened? What a huge, for me as an anthropologist, huge question, what happened? Middle class Pakistani family, the last thing they want to do is become aware that their daughter has gone off and joined the uh, ISIS group. So why? How did that happen? We need to be thinking about these issues <clears throat> in a serious way, in a sociological way. Unfortunately, there's too little serious thinking, both in the community and outside it. She's your test case, <clears throat> because in the end, she's disappeared. She's probably not alive now. So the community has lost a member of its own, one of the families has lost one of the stars of its own, own tradition. And I, I would say that a potential star, because when you read her, and we read her, and we've quoted her, she's a very bright young woman. She reads, she thinks, but her life begins to change, and you can see her thinking. Hatred begins to infuse her thinking. Violence begins to infuse it. And before long, she's reflecting that in a hatred of the Shia. Shia has become the enemy, because that's how ISIS saw the world. There was always an enemy. <coughs> so, the young and the old. Number two, we need to remember that the imams, the religious leaders, are the guides of the community. They're like the rabbis or the Jews or the priests among the Christians, or your professor or your guide or some elder who you can talk to. The imam in Europe hasn't been able to play the potential role that he's capable of. Um, the, the imams in Germany, for example, come from Turkey. They come on a contract, four-year contract. They come, they live in their own cultural bubble, and after four years, they go back. So there's no incentive to really interact. And as a result, if you have a local girl in Germany who's like Aksa, who is she going to go to? She's not that free with her parents. In our culture, there's always some formality. They don't, we don't have that freedom that uh, uh, English kids have that they can talk to their parents more freely. And they are then blocked. So in Germany, the imam who would be the natural man to talk, talk to is not really available because of cultural problems. Um, we need to be very careful about having imams who understand local culture, who are able to interpret it both to the younger generation and vice versa. Their problems then back to their community. That is not happening and is not happening with quite the speed that I would like it to uh, take place. Then the lack of uh, coordination and cooperation between the local administration and local Muslim leadership. By that I mean <clears throat> the social, political, religious Muslim leadership. That is happening, it's happening in patchwork over here, maybe over there, but not as it should be happening because there are too many, too many terrorist strikes that take place. Just too many, every few months, every few weeks. And every time that happens, remember Rabbi Bent Melchior. It feeds into a picture that Muslims are basically violent, and then all the theories of the experts come into play. We mentioned the experts, and they begin to say the Quran preaches violence and that kind of nonsense. And then very quickly people are saying, yeah, the Muslims are violent because the Quran pre preaches violence. Again and again, I've had to answer this question about Islam and violence, and again and again, I've had to refute it as a scholar. But it's out there, and one individual or 10 individuals, a 1,000 individuals cannot completely refute it. It has to be taken on in a mainstream way where television, radio, and all begin to understand the gravity of not understanding why it needs to be refuted, but this idea is a very powerful and a very strong idea. We also saw that interfaith works a great deal. We tend to poo-poo it and dismiss it and say, these are goodwill people just sitting and chatting and talking to the converted. But interfaith has a big impact. Most of Muslim societies are traditional societies. So when Muslim societies see an imam talking to a rabbi or a bishop or a priest, it reinforces their sense that we can talk and we can build bridges. It has worked again and again, it's worked. And as an example, I often quote the 
Bradford case study, which we have in the book and the film, where some members of a right-wing group stormed into the mosque while Muslims were at prayer, while they were bowing down to say their prayer and worship their God. And this group came in with the Bibles and wearing shoes, uh, with mud on them and walked in front of these people. And this incident created a crisis. And I then recorded four different ways of looking at that incident. We talked to the head of the right-wing group. We talked to the imam of the mosque, the man who, in fact, is the uh, leading figure in the Islamic organization, Islamic Council of Bradford. We talked to the mayor, and we talked to the bishop. So again, looking at one thing from four different perspectives. And it was the bishop who gave the strongest response. The bishop in his uh, full uh, uh, clerical uniform, in which he said, this is outrageous, I'm quoting him, he said, the Bible is not meant to be used as a weapon where you come in and try to hit people with it. It's outrageous what happened in that mosque. So interfaith is very powerful, and we need to constantly reinforce it and bring it out into the, into the public. Media. I've mentioned the media, but media needs to be really tackled, and I would urge uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pro Director here to encourage students to not only be scholars, but be scholars interacting with the media. Because you write a book, you write a, an essay, and you really ask yourself how many people read this outside the department or your colleagues. It's got to be out there in the media. I would like to see these great scholars on television, on radio, so that their ideas are carrying. Because the media needs to have expert advice. And unfortunately, I don't see it here in the UK. I don't see it in America. But you have some extraordinary scholars, some really giants there. Very few times will you see them uh, on, on the screen or in, in one of the television or radio shows. And finally, I want to come back to the idea of knowledge and understanding uh, with the word ilm. Ilm is a word in Arabic which means knowledge or learning. And ilm is so important in Islam that I want the non-Muslims to remember this fact. Ilm is used more often in the Quran than any other word except the word for God. So no religion has an emphasis on knowledge as does Islam. The Quran is repeatedly saying learning, learning, learning. The Prophet of Islam said something very, very moving and very powerful, which I love quoting. And here it is. I think this could be a great motto for any uh, institution. The ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. It's a very powerful saying. This is the Prophet of Islam. And if Muslims could only understand the significance of the saying, it would change the way they look at politics, at scholarship, and their own destiny. Because unfortunately, people like ISIS have inverted this. For them, it's the blood of the martyr that matters, not the ink of the scholar. So I come back to Ilm, and I want to end with this. Because it's a very powerful image. It's a hopeful image. Andalusia, in its heyday, this is the antithesis of the primordial identity paradigm, if you like, in its heyday had libraries, 93 libraries in Cordoba alone. Think of it. Cordoba was then the greatest city of Europe, greatest city in population and civilization and so on. 93 libraries. The main library had 600,000 volumes. When the greatest library of Europe then had 600 volumes. And a few years ago, Harvard University produced more pamphlets and books in one department than the entire Arab world put together. So you can see how this relationship has uh, become asymmetrical over history because Muslims have lost the capacity to respect and honor learning, ilm. Uh, ilm then produced people like Ibn Firnas, Cordoba, 9th century. Scholar, scientist, uh, mathematician, all these were great uh, Renaissance men long before this term became popular and associated with, uh, with the Renaissance. So Ibn Firnas does many, many other things, but he also attempts flight, and he's the first man to attempt flight. It's not Leonardo da Vinci, it's not the Wright brothers. He climbs up on a hill, he's experimenting with these big wings, and he jumps off, and it is recorded that he lasts 10 minutes before he comes, crashing down, which unfortunately the laws of gravity are very strong, even in Andalusia. But to honor him, even today in Spain, you have a huge bridge, one of the main bridges of, uh, of Cordoba, 
is in the shape of wings to honor Ibn Farnas. And a crater on the moon, a crater on the moon is, has been named after Ibn Farnas to show that the scientific body does not believe in, in this kind of religious uh, prejudice. This wasn't only restricted to Muslims. Christians, Jews participated aggressively in this culture and contributed to it. And then the impact of convivencia, the notion of coexistence, the antithesis to primordial identity, where we can live together as different cultures, religions, with respect for one another. This was also practiced by Christian kings in Europe then. Many examples, Roger II, Alfonso X, and of course the great example of Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, one of my favorites, one of my heroes, and very few people in Europe today, I, I'm sad to say this, even have heard the name of Frederick II. They haven't heard the name. I would want him to be taught at schools, not even at universities, at schools. This man spoke Arabic, had Muslims in his bodyguard, and his imperial cloak, the coronation cloak of the, uh, cloak of the emperors, Holy Roman emperors, had Arabic script on it. And the jewel in his uh, kingdom, uh, the chapel in uh, Palermo, beautiful chapel, has Arabic script and Arabic images throughout. That's how close they were at that time in history. Finally, let me end with the notion of humanity. We scientists often squeeze out the human element in our work. So we are pure scientists, so we don't even recognize that we are human beings first and foremost. And we need to, in that sense, really go back to the Greeks and the notion of humanity and universal humanity, and with it, universal humility. Because what motivated me starting on this journey was the idea of how little we knew that we had to acquire knowledge, for me personally, after so many of these projects, just to learn about my own community. So I really went with a blank check. My mind was blank. I had to be a student to learn. One of the greatest things that Socrates said, as far as I'm concerned, is that the only thing he knew was that he knew nothing. And that's a great way of approaching knowledge. So here are three things I'll leave you with. One, the notion of humanity and compassion. We know Jesus symbolizes compassion. We know that God's definition in Islam is based on Rahman and Rahim, the two most beautiful names of God. God himself selects them. And we know that Judaism rests in the notion of tikkun olam, to heal a fractured world. Now, if you see the world as fractured with all the religious and the ethnic violence and conflict, then you, it's your duty to go out and heal it. And I don't have to remind you of the non-Abrahamic faiths, Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism, who's at the very heart of which lies the notion of non-violence and reaching out and accepting all of human and animal life. And with that image, I shall leave you and be happy to have any questions. Lord Bikubarik, please come up. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask Lord Bhikkhu Parekh to speak first because then, as, as Dr. Ahmed said, he'll have to leave immediately to go and get a train. So uh, I'll ask him to give a few responses. He will leave and then we'll uh, move to questions. Thank you. Is that working? Yeah. Can you hear me at the back? Well, first of all, uh, I want to begin by thanking Professor Ahmed for this absolutely brilliant uh, and scintillating exposition of his, the basic argument of his book. And he was so uh, captivating that the entire audience was swept off his feet. And I didn't feel like asking the moderator the 20 minutes were over, could, we, could I please come in and say a few things? Uh, first of all, uh, I want to compliment Professor Akbar on this great generosity. You see, when an author writes, we simply tend to concentrate on the author. We tend to forget the man, as you say, toward the end, the man behind the author. 
And what you see here is absolutely remarkable, which I haven't seen before. There may be other examples, which is the book is dedicated, amongst others, to one of his students, who was part of his team. And he writes about it in the following way, which I found absolutely fascinating. Where he says, referring to Frankie Martin, he became like a favorite son. No father could be uh, prouder of his offspring than I am of Frankie. Now that is a remarkable tribute from a guru to his chela, from a teacher to his student. And I want, and it shows the generosity of the spirit and the sensitivity with which you approach your uh, colleagues and part of your team. No wonder your team has been so loyal and faithful to you. Now, the other thing about the book, since I've had the privilege of reading the book, is the enormous amount of information it provides, some of which I had never heard before. I knew something about the German love of forests, but didn't know about the German love affair with the wolf. And if you look at the, most of the German first names, like Adolf Hitler, now you know what Adolf means? The book tells us it means a noble wolf. Rolf, advice of a wolf. Or now, there are other words, right? well, German words, which have this kind of wolf-like origin. Or, for example, I had not realized that the word, uh, uh, the word Dutch, I have often wondered where it came from, that the word Dutch is derived from the same roots as Deutsch, German. So there are some fascinating tidbits in the book, and which alone make the book worth reading. But I want to concentrate on uh, three important questions, uh, and I may not be able to stay on here to hear the answers, but I hope that Professor Ahmad will be able to answer them. The first thing is he talks about the British and French colonialism and suggesting that the British was more benign <laughs> than the French. Now, I'm not entirely sure that this is the case. Uh, perhaps it can be shown in some way that the Brits were more benign, but as somebody who comes from uh, India, as I do, with the story of the British brutality, which Sashi Tharoor and others have recorded, or about the British in East Africa, in Kenya, in Mau Mau, and elsewhere, I think their record was no better. I wouldn't say it's worse, but no better than the French. And if one then looks at the way in which the French colonialism at least gave the promise of equality, that the French colonialism had a cultural core, the British had a racial core. So that in the British case, you could do nothing to be equal to them. In the French, at least you could make an effort by acquiring elegant French and command of the French literature. So given the fact that neither has much to be said for it, one needs to account for why the, the record of two countries has been so different. The British have been much more sympathetic to the migrants, in a, far more in some respects, than the French have been. Now, if the explanation cannot be entailed in terms of the history, what can it be in terms of? And here I think, uh, well, Professor Ahmad, I'm sure, has many answers, but I would suggest one way would be the British hospitality to the idea of plurality. That if one look at the way in which you were struggling and I was struggling in those days when we came here, the British were far more sympathetic to toleration of differences to the respect and the dignity of differences. But the French nation state was entirely based on the idea of uniformity. The French were not as tolerant of difference. Differences within a shared identity, but not differences outside the identity. So that's one point I would like you to, to think about. The other point I want to raise is this whole idea of being a Muslim. An individual has many identities. I mean, I'm a Hindu, I'm an Indian, I'm a professor, I'm a lord, I'm a very good friend of uh, Akbar Ahmed, lots of things. When and why would I want to stress the fact that I'm a Hindu? Why would anybody want to stress that he's a Muslim? Far more than other identities. Now there the answer would be that that identity somehow has become so important to him. Why? And there are several answers. And here again, I would like Professor Ahmed to respond. One is other identities might not be available to me. I might not be able to call myself British because being British is so defined that it rules out people like me. If being British means being white or being Christian or being uh, uh, middle class, I can't count myself British, so that identity is not available to me. 
Pakistani or Indian identity might not available available to me because I might not care for the customs of those countries. So if no other identity is available, and yet the identity is crucial because I need to define myself in terms of certain values which I derive from my religion. So also groups from different countries, Iraqis, Assyrians, Pakistanis and others, what is the uniting factor? Religion. So the question is why does religion become the axis, the basis of one's identity? And that is because it allows people to unite across ethnic boundaries. It provides values one is looking for. It is the ground of one's self-worth. Because in today's situation, if Muslims in certain parts of the world were to ask, what are we proud of? And one thing we can proud of, be proud of, is religion. So for all, the, for all these reasons, religion becomes very important. Which means that if I want to counter that self-definition, I want to urge those people not to define themselves merely as Muslims but as human, I need to counter those factors which make it compulsory for them to acquire the single Muslim identity. And there I think the idea of Imams being educated in, in, in uh, the receiving country or uh, better understanding and so on is helpful, but I don't think it would be enough. An Imam can be educated here and still be just as extreme as anybody could be. And lots of ideas of Muslims are derived not just from uh, the Imam, but from, in, from internet and lots of other sources. So think of a situation where Imams are educated here, dialogue goes on between interfaith, but again we're at a superficial level. So I would suggest that all those things are very important, absolutely right, crucial. But we also need to emphasize the attitude of the host society. In some sense, the host society's attitude to the Muslim is the representation, expression of its view of itself. So its self-understanding needs to be countered. The British need to define themselves, their own identity in such a way that the Muslim can feel at home in it. And I think the uh, last point, uh, which I can stop here, because I do really want to hear your, <laughs> your answers, the last point simply would be uh, in terms of uh, the way in which, I think you go on to explain, which you didn't discuss here, is how many people from which country had joined ISIS. And Professor Ahmed, I must say, is extraordinarily perceptive when he appreciates the role of Berbers. I had not realized this, having been in the House of Lords and having had those debates, that if you look at the, who were the groups from which Muslims in France or Spain, they're coming from, and they're not any Muslim, they're mainly Berbers. Why Berbers? And what do Berbers bring with them? Tribal consciousness, sense of revenge, sense of vengeance, sense of justice. Now here I think the question is, if you look at four countries for which he provides data, UK has sent 760 people to join ISIS, France 1700, Germany 760, and Denmark 120. So Denmark would seem to be the nicest, safest country. But then he provides a fascinating uh, angle to it, which is rather than look at these abstract figures, look at the number of population. What is the population of Muslims and what does this represent? And there if you look at uh, Denmark 120, out of a Muslim population of how much? Britain, 760, out of a Muslim population of how much? And if you do that, per 100,000 Muslims, how many have gone to ISIS? Denmark, 46. France, 34. UK, 24. Germany, 16. So Denmark, which appears to have sent the fewest, turns out to be the most prone to violence, for precise, on precisely those grounds. Now that I think is, 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 is a very good way of looking at things. I really appreciate this. But there the question for me is, if one looks at Belgium, where the record is quite different, which you don't provide here, or if one looks at the Dutch or Norway, one begins to see a slightly different picture of people going out and uh, working with the ISIS. So I think with those uh, three general remarks for you to think on, my last hope would be 
that for somebody who has done so much for us to uh, help us understand the Muslim fears, anxieties, promises, I would like him to return home. Return home, it means to our part of the world, South Asia, and do something with his team, maybe adding some few more people from the subcontinent, looking at the Islam in South Asia. Afghanistan, from Kabul to Calcutta, that was your, <laughs> your slogan. From Kabul to Calcutta, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, even uh, Myanmar, looking at the kind of Islam that has grown up in our part of the world, its strengths, so it never became brutal, and if you look at the number of ISIS going out from Kerala and other parts of India, it's very small, but at the same time, rather uncomfortable, and Hindus in India have, have been making a complete mess of their inability to provide any kind of conveniencia uh, with Muslims. So I hope that having done this book, we could persuade Professor Ahmed to return home, which is the best way to end your academic life. And when you do that, I suppose I would be invited, I hope you will. To launch it. <laughs> if not to launch it, that sounds too presumptuous, but to be able to comment on it, because in spite of all my work in philosophy, I remain an Indian at heart. I want to understand my own country and its neighbors and be at peace with them. And here, perhaps your understanding of Islam might be able to help us in coping with its challenges better than we have done so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. yes, I'll uh, answer very quickly because uh, uh, Dr. Abgur is uh, aware of the, the time and I know that uh, Biko wants to catch his train back. Um, first of all, Biko, you're raising the question of returning home as it was South Asia. Well, I've already got half a team sitting here, including CJ, my French student who's come from Paris to join us here. We've got Teresa, we've got various members and fresh members like Farhan, I hope he'll join us, Mina's here. So we certainly would want to think of something like this, again involving this, on the condition that you join me. So we'll, we'll, we'll take the road together. Now very quickly, your three questions, I'll try to summarize my responses. They, they raise all kinds of issues. The, the business of the British versus the French, every country has a different philosophy of colonization. And to me, that's the root of the difference. The French were not always as brutal as they became in the late 19th century. If you go back to Napoleon Bonaparte, who arrives in Cairo, he starts wearing Arab dress. He calls himself Sheikh Ali. And the Muslims are taken in. They say, well, this man loves Islam. What a wonderful man. And they begin to say he's better than the Ottoman Turks. He's much more sympathetic to us. He gives a dinner, an iftar dinner, during the month of Ramadan in which he invites the sheikhs from uh, Al-Azhar. So the direction of French colonialism could have been very different if that philosophy had been followed, but it wasn't. By the 1830s and 40s, a very different kind of approach was taken, and there it was sheer brutality. And we've the given British you the figure. The no, the British did, and I've when not overlooked it. No, no, I've got all that. I've got yeah. all the Bengal and the famines and Churchill and everything and the Mau Mau and so on. In fact, Frankie Martin spent his uh, earlier years in, in yeah. Kenya. So we've got all that. There is a difference, because and study it again, I know that, uh, and I admire Shashi Tharoor's book, but again, that can be uh, very sweeping. I mean, if you look at the reforms that the British are constantly bringing in, the, the Civil Service Commission, slowly, very slowly, but they're beginning to absorb local ICS officers who may be Indians or Muslims or Hindus or whatever, but there's always this constant attempt to include them. The colleges, even uh, Aligarh was created uh, under the patronage of the, the British and so on. So there's a very, very distinct difference in the way they are administering because the concept of Queen Victoria was the concept of the Queen of India. So in that sense, in a romantic, symbolic sense, she embraced and included her empire. And the jewel in the crown, of course, was India. So I'm just simplifying this. In terms of um, the second question, why are Muslims emphasizing Muslim identity? We need to remember identity is something we have innate in us, but also other people impose identity on us. Uh, the, the Germans told me, many uh, Germans we interviewed, that before 9-11, we looked at uh, Turks living amongst us and we said, he's Turkish, he's from Syria, he's from Pakistan. But after 9-11, he said a new identity emerged. They just said he's Muslim. And these Turks would come and say, why are you suddenly calling us Muslim? 
So he said, this is how we know you as now. So identity is now being imposed. And an individual Muslim can do very little about it. And you're sort of stuck with it. Thirdly, your uh, comment on uh, terrorism and uh, the breakup. As you know, I have a whole chapter on this. Mm. And I found this very, very interesting how the ethnic background of these terrorists helped us understand what they were up to and how they can be challenged and checked, mm -hmm. which the security people so far haven't really picked up. So they're still looking at it in terms of the Quran and the verses in the Quran and so on, and they not, haven't switched to an anthropological understanding of terrorism. So there's a lot of work to be done, uh, Biko, and I hope people will read it as thoroughly as you have and as kindly as you have. Oh, Thank you very much, Biko. We don't want you to miss your text. <laughs> Well, I hope I have started off the questions and answers, and now Professor Akbar is entirely at your disposal. Questions from the audience. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to turn back to the I think you have to catch up. I don't want you to miss your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, do we, we have a roving mic here, I think, so... Best to use that. I'll take two or three questions. So if you have a question as well, put your hand up and I'll come to you. Yeah, you discussed identity a lot in that talk and specifically the contrast between um, sort of Pakistani Muslims who have that national culture to fall back on and the third generation um, Muslims in this country, in Europe, and the converts. And it would seem to me that it's not the different identities that face the challenges we have, but the act of trying to find an identity. Um, do you agree with that? And if so, what can the minority do to rem remedy it? And what can the majority do to remedy that? It's the same thing, the discovery of identity, exactly the same thing, depends how you phrase it. Yes. That was an answer. That was yeah. very, all right. That, that was the fastest answer I've ever heard an academic give in my life. Um, other questions? Oh, okay. I was just wondering when you were talking about Aksa's uh, incident and when you were talking about, you were answering to Pro Lord Bhikkhu Parikh's answer uh, that, uh, that religion or identity which become primary identities in a retrospective. So for me, when I was thinking about Aksa's question, I think uh, I, was, I, I was wondering why we need to go back to Islam to understand what Aksa did because Aksa was product of European society in a sense, with holding that 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 faith which she had. So for me, it was I, I was wondering that uh, if that things were happening in Europe or in wherever she was, and you said that in retrospective. So why not we look at Aksa's what Aksa did in retrospective of European society in that sense? Here we are, man. It's like Connor's question. I don't understand your question because that's exactly what I suggested. I said we need to analyze Aksa sociologically, not religiously. What she was doing wasn't religious. She was, and I gave you the case study in some detail to point out she was having problems with her parents. They weren't communicating. I've given the details in, in the book. Um, every time she talked to her father, he would dismiss her. He would be contemptuous because they were horrified at the idea of her becoming very orthodox and they were quite secular in the, the way they approached uh, their society. But it was her then being pushed away by her parents, by the authority figures that forced her into the basement and coming online and then being in touch with some of our uh, imams and mullahs in the Middle East and then taking that line. So that's where religion comes in and her understanding of religion. Question in the front here and then also from Professor Ed Simpson. Director of South, South Asian Institute, over there. We'll take these two questions together. Thank you very much for the session. You have been for enlightening us about your journey to Europe, journey into Europe, and you were from Austria, I think, but you are here today. Can I ask you a question about a slightly sidetracking the issue? Donald Trump has offered Jerusalem to the Israelis as a pledge. The whole Muslim world, and there are more than 50 countries, they are silent on it. Are the Muslims not interested in Jerusalem? And uh, what is your view, <coughs> personal view about it? 
And why do the uh, Arabs down there uh, know Hezbollah's problem? Thank you. A very interesting question, but neither Donald Trump nor Jerusalem are in Europe, so our subject is journey into Europe. And as far as the Muslim countries are concerned, the OIC has had a special session where various prime ministers and presidents came. Now, how powerful, effective they are, you know that yourself. Okay, I've got a question down here from uh, Professor Ed Simpson, Director of Science at the South Asia Institute, and then there's two more questions here. I'll come to you afterwards, but you obviously like answering them one at a time. Yes, <laughs> one, one, no, at a time. one at a time is fine. Yeah, good. Uh, Professor Ahmed, thank you very much for a meticulous and inspiring talk. Uh, you talked a lot about the ways in which an anthropological method had helped you do the research. I wonder if you could say something about how an anthropological way of thinking might, help, might have helped you with the conclusions. What helped me a lot, um, Dr. Simpson, uh, was not simply being an anthropologist in the field. I've also been a field officer and have had to deal with large communities, different communities, with fairness, with neutrality, and with a basic human compassion. So sometimes anthropologists swing so far towards trying to be as scientific as possible that they overlook this human element, the element of compassion, trying to understand that society, and in some senses, representing it. Uh, I didn't restrict it to anthropology. I'm also a, a political scientist. I'm a scholar of religion. So I was using these other disciplines. But what I found very useful was some of the method. And again, they were, uh, you have to be careful there because anthropologists prefer, as you know, to go out in the field a year or two or three maximum in the field studying a village or a suburb, a small community, we were taking a whole continent. We were spending literally years on it, and I was going out with the whole team. So there was, to an extent, we were borrowing from anthropology, and to an extent, we were just uh, being uh, innovative and creative. Thank you. There's a question about at the back there, just behind you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry I missed your talk. Uh, the failing infrastructure of this declined uh, reality has delayed me by an hour in this country. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I gather by looking at your book outside that you've addressed elements of this point. But sure, surely the issue of Europe, like America, but I think much more complex than the American sort of context, is uh, um, the fundamental subsumed hypocrisy of European academia, media, and culture for the last 70 years after the so-called end of empire, where the imperial motive, on a supremacist, a racist, and uh, um, um, uh, quite ancient in some ways, sort of an inferiority complex from the days of enslavement of Northern Europe to the Romans, attitude to uh, the rest of the world in the, in, in, after the post-war period is, I mean, it's exposed now. And it's ironic that we've had to go through five years of anti-racist campaigning. When I was young, we thought that was over in the mid-90s. So it's almost like there's a trend that is often, in my opinion, mistakenly regarded as fascism, but actually is pervasive in the liberal elite of a, a racist, supremacist um, revival of the abuses of the last 300 years. And that, I think, requires, and as you've done, a critical analysis, as I think Malaysia is doing, on European cultures from the Occident in complete separation to the conceptual frameworks of, of France or, or whatever. Because if we do that, we may find there's lots of hypocrisies in institutions, universities, and attitudes to the maltreatment of people who are considered not the other, but inferior. We're not considered the other. I think this is a misnomer. We're considered inferior racially. And this is the kind of attitude that leads to 700 Africans drowning, being called cockroaches, and a limited reaction to that. So my point is, in terms of Islam, Islam being multivarious abode of many races, that it's really not our problem. Our problem is geopolitical. In the era of the rise of China and the, the so-called one world, two systems, many of these subsumed facts that immigrants, who, who are not really immigrants, we've been here three, four generations, uh, have come to light. And that is the great silence of the Western media now that the economy has collapsed, of the racism and imperial attitude to all people outside of the hierarchical European context. So my question is, Islam and Muslims are not really the problem, despite particular political issues. It, Europe is the problem in their attitude to the rest of the world. I'm not well, sure that's strictly a your, question. But. Thank you for your comment and question. I would urge you to read the book, and you'll find a lot of the answers there. Last question you want. 
No, 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 we can have a couple more. There's another question. Hi there. Um, I look forward to reading your book. Uh, sorry, my question is, do you not think the impact of a whitewashed curriculum is feeding the fire that contributes to a, towards the rise of the alt-right? I didn't get that. Please. Sorry. Say it again more clearly. Uh, do you not think the impact of a whitewashed curriculum that we currently have within the United Kingdom, and I imagine in many parts of Europe, are what contributes towards the fire in which uh, has caused the alt-right to significantly grow? I think a syllabus by itself does not contribute one way or the other. These are forces, again, if you look at my book, I study all that is happening in Europe today, like the uh, gentleman asked there, in the context of European history, and I go back 2,000 years. For example, the story of Germany for me begins with Germania, with Tacitus, that is 2,000 years ago, when the idea of German identity is first put down on paper. And those ideas are very strong in all societies, and there's nothing wrong with it because that's your primary identity. What becomes dangerous is when that takes the form of predatory identity, when you begin to focus on a minority. And that can happen when societies feel under threat, under pressure, as they're feeling now in Europe with the hundreds of thousands of immigrants. So a solution has to be found. Now, whether they teach that or don't teach that, people are free to go out and read their own books. No one's going to stop you from that and then think for yourself. I don't think that, uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Sivgal, are you actually omitting all this from the syllabus or not? I'm not sure, perhaps you could comment on that. I would say in some cases, yes, in many cases, no, but that's a deeply political issue here and I probably wouldn't be trusted to give the, to give the <laughs> neutral answer. The neutral answer to that. <laughs> um, so we've got Amina and then a gentleman behind there, or someone behind there in a blue shirt. And we'll take these two questions together and then uh, we'll wrap up. Then Dr. Bolt. We'll get another one too. Um, okay. Professor Ahmed, thank you for such a wonderful and erudite presentation. Um, I consider myself one of the lucky people who've also had the opportunity to um, benefit generously from this um, research that you conducted, part of which uh, we were involved with in the British journey. And uh, my question is uh, connected to one of the disciplines that you said you draw on, which is uh, political science. And um, I'm really intrigued by this because, and, and actually your work has inspired me to think about this quite a lot. And it's, it's the context of identity in relation to models of citizenship. And you talk um, rightly about convivencia and that particular model of, well, I'd like you to sort of maybe talk a little bit more about that model of citizenship and what you see in that. Is, is there a model there that we can borrow on and draw from in the modern period? Or is, is that sort of modern period more based around a democratic structure of citizenship that is not available to us in Andalusia? So how do we make that journey, make that connection. I'd be interested. Yeah. 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 Hi. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the solutions that you proposed, which was kind of more interfaith dialogue, more um, prominent experts on Islam in the media, for example. And I'm just wondering whether, since we have this problem with religion and Europe, Shouldn't the solution not be more religion, but maybe more secularism, more humanism, and more um, teaching about these values that aren't tied to uh, religious doctrines? Yeah, and then uh, was there another question down here? Here. Last question. Last question. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, there's a question I want to ask. My name is Dr. Roger Bowes. Uh, I have a question about um, Muslim Spain. Uh, the Muslims were expelled from Spain in 1609 to 1614, and this is something that's not taught in schools at all. We learn about the Holocaust. We don't. This is an, a, a, a good example of, of ethnic cleansing. Uh, when some 60,000 Muslims were expelled to North Africa and to, to, and to um, Constantinople, and even some of them ended up in the New World, um, and. I, I want to make a suggestion that a school curriculum should include this in, uh, uh, as, as an important uh, part of the work. Yes, so we have three questions. I'll try to briefly answer them and um, 
release you then into the evening. Dr. Amina first. First of all, let me express my very warm gratitude for her incredible support and Professor Peter Morris for the project. They joined us in field work, contributed at every level. In fact, Peter Morris in the film as the executive producer, and they were right from the word go, completely behind us and worked with us and were great partners. So thank you, Amina, and thank you for allowing me to say it publicly. And as you know, it's very much uh, in the book and the project. Now, you raised a very serious question, and I know that our director would not be happy if he sat all evening uh, and I expounded on it. But it really is important because the man I want to refer you to is Max Weber, who is, as it were, the guru of modernity. And it's critical because he is the quintessential European philosopher, scholar, sociologist, uh, and political scientist. Now, r raising this specter, the specter of Weber, in fact leads us to the idea of modernity. And I believe that with what's going on now, and there's another question about humanism, what's going on now challenges the foundations of Western modernity at its most basic, and Europeans have to understand that it's a much bigger battle than just to preserve the Muslim minority. And therefore, what you're saying, about how can you clarify these ideas? They have to be clarified not simply in, level, in terms of immediate strategy, tactical strategies, but long-term strategies. How do we deal with our citizens on, the long, on a long-term basis? Because the very basis of modernity is that every citizen has rights. That's Max Weber's ideal type. You cannot say everyone has rights except women in hijab or except Muslims or except this or except that, and that is happening in many societies. In some societies in East Europe, for example, it's very open. It's open and it's said openly. And there are high levels of uh, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and anti-Romaism and anti all kinds of minorities. So these are European countries and they are, in a sense, facing this crisis, and I have a feeling they're not fully aware of this theoretical implication that you've raised. So, I mean, I hope you are now going to write a scholarly paper on precisely this, and refer to Weber and Ibn Khaldun, because he brings in the tribalism for Europe, not North Africa. I apply him to European tribalism. The um, uh, question about religion and uh, more humanism, I think you missed out the last 10 minutes of my talk, but that's precisely what I said. I ended with humanism and I said, ended with the importance of humanism in understanding each other, not simply restricting it to religion. Uh, Dr. Bose talked about not understanding or not knowing about Andalusia, for example, in Europe. And again, he's right, he's the scholar of Andalusia. As we traveled, we became very aware of two things. The south of Europe, the southern states, who knew of, Andal of uh, Andalusia and Convivencia and in uh, the uh, Italian-speaking, Latin-speaking uh, part of Europe, it's called Convivencia. It still exists, but with a different uh, spelling. They were aware of this. And in some instances, there are still examples of this alive today. But Northern Europe, A, didn't know about this, so take a test, just ask your neighbors about Convivencia, what it means, and B, didn't really care very much for it because there's also a North-South division in terms of Europe. Northern Europeans, by and large, think that they have a superior culture, more dominant culture, etc., etc., compared to the South. We found this uh, throughout Europe. When um, Dr. Bose talks about 1492, he's absolutely right. The final expulsion came a few years later, but 1492 is the turning point, is the year. Now, I was told again and again by Spanish Muslim converts and non-Muslim Spanish, they said our history books begin teaching history after 1492. So if you're not going to learn about what happened and this huge event in history when the entire Muslim and Jewish population is expelled, you're not, you're not going to have any idea what took place and of the civilization of Andalusia. That's why I come back to the idea of revisiting Europe, European history, and then trying to create a new Andalusia, a new synthesis for the future. It's, it's a challenge and it has to, in a sense, come from the the, uh, from uh, the universities, the scholars, the centers of learning, because they have to provide these new ideas. These are the challenges of our times, and you can see from the questions, the public wants answers to this, and you know they hope and expect uh, the scholars to give them some kind of a lead. And so these are not just academic issues. 
And I want to emphasize that I approach this with great humility because I've lived here, I've lived here, and I've been a great Anglophile in my life because I've appreciated English culture. I got my education from English-speaking teachers, both at university, at schools, and uh, throughout my life. But at the same time, I'm aware of the changes taking place in society and the challenges. And these challenges have to be met. And we can only wish and pray that Europe succeeds in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think you'll agree that was a, a wonderful and very stimulating evening. Please pick up your copy of Journey into Europe on the way out, um, just outside the door, and please go safely this evening. Thank you.